Hello and welcome to Wonk Live Peer Exchange, uh, entitled Practical Implications for New Treatment Strategies in Advanced Ovarian Cancer. I'd like to focus on recurrent ovarian cancer. Uh, although uh, there is great hope for cure in newly diagnosed advanced ovarian cancer, and although we have new FDA approvals in the frontline setting with Nirapirib in all comers, uh, as per April 29th approval of Prima, and as per the FDA approval of PALA-1 on May 8th with the Laparib and Bevacizumab in the HRD cohorts, uh, it's, a, it's, it, it's, it's difficult to say, but still true, that most of our patients develop recurrence. The first agent approved in recurrent ovarian cancer course was Bevacizumab. Uh, this was in November 14th, 2014, Aurelia. Uh, this was a very small step forward in platinum-resistant recurrent ovarian cancer in second or third line with a hazard ratio of 0.38 and only a three-month improvement in progression-free survival. But then uh, uh, in uh, December of 2016, we got a platinum-sensitive option, which was a little better, uh, which had two chemotherapy backbones, carboplatin gemcitabine, a la Oceans, and carboplatin paclitaxel, a la GOG213. And Ocean showed a little bit better improvement in progression-free survival with a four-month improvement, but uh, uh, Oceans, uh, excuse me, GOG213, a five-month improvement in survival. So that was good. It, it's definitely a not enough. I think most of us sort of prefer bevacizumab in the frontline setting. Um, Leslie, I'm going to ask you, what percentage of patients do you think with ovarian cancer get bevacizumab at some point? Um, hopefully most. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it being frontline, platinum-sensitive, platinum-resistant, really, you know, and being an active drug, I would hope that most of them, if not all of them, receive BEV at some point. Yeah. So in the platinum resistance setting, uh, Shannon, sort of, you know, all else being equal, what's your preferred chemotherapy backbone of those three Aurelia options? I, I tend to lean towards the weekly paclitaxel. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we, we saw in the lab that there's something about the way those two drugs interact that we get a, a even more bonus um, anti-angiogenic activity, and I think the patients tolerate it really well, too. Yeah. So the two approvals, Matt, in, in our country, are, as you know, are carbogem, carbopaclitaxel in the sensitive space, but there's a lot of discussion about carbopld as a third option. What's sort of your go-to regimen in the platinum-sensitive space if bevacizumab is a part of that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, certainly looking at patient factors to help drive that, uh, you know, the advantage of the PLD regimen is here, clearly the Q4 week uh, dosing schedule. So sometimes that's driving it. But uh, really looking at the quality of the level of the data from 213, you have an OS benefit with yeah. the addition of giving Taxol again, so Carbotaxol plus Bevacizumab. So really, you know, I think that's my go-to regimen when I actually have that additional bar beyond PFS. You have that such strong, uh, uh, on, you know, again, uh, right at the statistical cutoff, but it is positive. Yeah. When we look at OS. You know, I, I think Shannon said it very nicely that you know there there really is some special interaction with paclitaxel and bevacizumab. You know, whether you, you, whether it's cervical cancer, platinum resistant, or platinum sensitive ovarian cancer. So. And you really hate, you know, you hate to make neuropathy worse, but there's a lot of tricks that we have to try to minimize that, alternate taxanes and things. So I think we can get patients through this. They're just not real excited about losing their hair again. And so it can be a, a little bit of a lengthy discussion. 